I would now like to introduce our speakers for today. Uh, we have David Cobb. Uh, David is a people's lawyer who has sued corporate polluters, lobbied elected officials, and run for political office himself. He's been arrested for nonviolent civil disobedience and believes we must provoke and win a peaceful revolution for a just, sustainable, and cooperative society if we are to survive. Uh, David currently serves on the Transition U.S. Collaborative Design Council, the board of directors of the United States Solidarity Economy Network, and is a co-founder of Cooperation Humboldt. Uh, so welcome, David. We're uh, so glad to have you with us. I also want to introduce Emily Colano, um, who is the co-director of the Wellspring Cooperative Corporation, uh, seeking to create an engine for new community-based job creation in Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, Emily also serves as co-coordinator of the United States Solidarity Economy Network. She's an economist by training, uh, served as the director of the Center for Popular Economics for many years, uh, has taught economics, uh, worked as the National Economic Justice Representative for the American Friends Service Committee. Uh, and we are very happy to have Emily with us uh, today as well. So I will turn it over to the two of you to talk about using a candidate questionnaire to advance solidarity economics. Thank you so much, Don, for that warm introduction. And I can't help but to have noticed that when you got to the part about nonviolent civil disobedience, it cracked a smile and I saw the sparkle in your eye. And I, I always say that I know I'm in the right crowd when that's the part of my bio that elicited, elicits the response. Uh, because I do want to be sincere that for myself, uh, I'm in it to win it, y'all. Uh, I, I do believe that not only must we restructure the society, I genuinely believe that it's possible to do. We can literally restructure our entire society because our current society is fundamentally racist, it's fundamentally sexist, it's fundamentally class oppressive, and as if that's not bad enough, the current economic system and the transnational corporations that are driving and controlling that system are literally destroying the planet that we depend upon for life itself. And I wanna say that as the sort of introductory piece for why I roll and invest my time with both Transition US and the US Solidarity Economy Network, because I have experienced both of these organizations, the leaders of those organizations, uh, the overall vision, goals, strategies, and tactics, uh, Transition US and the US Solidarity Economic Network genuinely believe that we are able to restructure society. And so with that, uh, I will now uh, have the task of, uh, of going through reimagining our, our future economy. Uh, and I am really excited uh, to be doing this. Uh, I just want to say a word. Cooperation Humboldt is a local example of building a solidarity economy on California's North Coast. We support existing cooperative efforts and create new solutions where needed. Uh, and I'll invite Emily uh, as one of the co-founders of the U.S. Solidarity Network if you want to say a word about SAN. Sorry, <laughs> just unmuting. Um, yeah, Solidarity Economy Network um, started in 2007. We grew out of a meeting, a series of meetings at the US Social Forum in Atlanta. Um, solidarity Economy at that time was pretty, was a pretty unknown term. And so we exist as a network to try to connect up and strengthen uh, the Solidarity Economy um, supporters, organizers, builders, practitioners in the US. And also um, we serve to connect the movement in the US to the international network called RIPESS. It's R-I-P-E-S-S, -S, um, which exists on all of the continents except for Antarctica. <laughs> Thank you, awesome. Emily. And I also want to add a quick word uh, and uh, 
there are so many examples of a new economy that are emerging, so many uh, networks and organizations, and it's exciting and wonderful, and we uh, applaud and support them all. And what makes the US Solidarity Economy Network, I think, uh, unique uh, is our absolute belief that we are pluralistic. We can work with anybody who are experimenting with new cooperative uh, manners, uh, uh, ways of being, and we are unflinching in our belief that capitalism as an economic system, by its very definition, is going to destroy the planet, uh, that we think that any changes to the economy uh, that would actually move towards genuine sustainability would mean that capitalism is so changed that it's no longer capitalism, which is to say we are post-capitalist. We think that it's important to simply embrace and acknowledge that the way capitalism works by its definition uh, of unlimited growth on a finite planet uh, is ultimately unsustainable. Uh, so there is Emily and David. You heard a little bit about us already, so I will go right through it. Uh, and I want to start with, uh, I have the privilege of just, so what is a solidarity economy? In a nutshell, it's one that puts people and planet before profit. It underscores and values both economic and social justice, diversity, cooperation, self-management, and ecological sustainability. As I said, it highlights alternatives to capitalism and articulates approaches to how the economy can serve people and planet rather than profit and blind growth. Emily, did you want to say anything in addition about the concept of solidarity economy? Rather than have Emily struggle to find her mute button, uh, I'll just go through this part because Emily is going to do the deep dive on the individual topics uh, of the, the core principles uh, or the policy statements that we're supporting. Here is uh, a, the characteristics of capitalism. Think of this as a definition, and I want to be really clear. Any economist, whether a high school econ uh, economy, economics teacher, a college professor, or a professional economist, will basically agree with this definition. Uh, there is no left Marxist progressive uh, input here. It is, there are five key characteristics. One, the private ownership of the means of production. By that we mean not just the factories, but the farms and the ranches. All of the different ways that you actually produce goods and services are privately owned. That's characteristic one. Char characteristics two, is that the goods and services are produced as commodities for sale as opposed for simply immediate use and need. This idea of commodity production is inherent in capitalism. The third characteristic is that the production and sale of goods and services are done for a profit, also known as profit maximization. Uh, the fourth is that way of uh, as wage labor, which is that labor itself is another commodity that's bought and paid for. And then the fifth is market exchange or that the market is used to allocate uh, both the supply, demand, goods and services, in, including labor as, uh, as a commodity. And the last thing to say is that these are an interconnected, inherently consistent way of understanding economic relationships. Because remember, economy comes from the Greek, which simply means the management of the household. And what we're talking about is the management of the national household or even the global household. So those are the characteristics of capitalism. And I will now editorialize and say, the reason that I am an explicit post-capitalist is because I believe that taken together, this creates and incentivizes what will ultimately destroy and consume Mother Earth faster than she can replenish herself. You cannot have unlimited growth on a finite planet. That is literally the very definition uh, of insanity. Uh, it's the ideology of the cancer cell. Emily, uh, again, I. I know I was tasked with this first part, but I do want to just invite you if there's anything that you would like to add here. No, that's good. Thanks. 
So now I am going to turn it over uh, to Emily because she uh, and our colleague Julie Matai wrote an incredibly uh, article, which I, we will link into the chat, on different types of system change. And uh, Emily, I'll turn this over to you and ask you to describe this slide. Okay. Yeah, this, we wrote this paper because uh, we've had lots of conversations with organizations like national organizations that are working on system change. But when we start getting into the weeds, like what do you mean by system change? There's a lot of fuzziness and uh, we thought it was really, we, we believe it's very important to be clear about what is capitalism because if what you want to do is move beyond capitalism, um, you need to know what it what the what defines capitalism in order to move beyond it. Um, and if you if you don't believe that, if you believe that we can actually reform capitalism, that's a position. Uh, folks in solidarity economy um, frame using a this framework would disagree. Right, we're committed to a post-capitalist vision, but in any case, what, whether you land in a post-capitalist or a capitalist reformed capitalist camp, um, clarity is really important. Um, so let me just start with the, the post-capitalist side. Um, you'll see that there we've blocked out sort of three main models or paradigms that are post-capitalist. So post-capitalist simply meaning after capitalism. Uh, and there is a logic to that, right? So some people ask, well, what, what's the difference between post and anti-capitalism? Frankly, to me, it's the same, right? If we're trying to get beyond capitalism, we're probably anti-capitalist, right? We believe there's, there's something wrong. We need to move beyond it. But post-capitalist is a little bit more, um, I think, doesn't make people as defensive. And it also indicates that there's a stage Right, capitalism is also a stage that sets the scene in terms of um, industrialization and productivity um, that lays a foundation for a post-capitalist uh, uh, vision. Um, so looking at the three um, broad, very broad paradigms, we have authoritarian sort of state socialism like the former Soviet Union or China or North Korea uh, would be examples of that. And if you look at the block that says solidarity economy, we clearly absolutely do not embrace um, non-democratic authoritarian um, uh, systems or paradigms that are, even if they're post-capitalist, if they're not democratic and they're authoritarian, we absolutely do not embrace uh, those models. So what we do embrace are um, various kinds of solidarity economy frameworks. Some people don't have call it anything, any particular ism in particular, right? Um, but they would, they would align themselves with solidarity economy. Other people might call themselves this, that, or the other strand or tendency of socialism. So as long as there are democratic forms of socialism um, and, and align with the values, right? Um, democracy, solidarity, equity in all dimensions, sustainability, we're good with that. Um, so there, it's a very, very big tent. There's lots of things that fit under the, both the democratic forms of socialism and all kinds of other uh, solidarity economy frameworks, big tent. Um, and then, so under capitalism, we break down three major sort of paradigms. So social democracy, you could think about that as um, Scandinavia, very, very strong social welfare state, very interventionist um, government. Um, New Deal as as a, what emerged after World War II in the United States, or after the Great Depression, in through the in through uh, World War II, um, you know, again, strong social safety net, uh, legitimate role of the government to regulate the economy and stabilize the economy and redistribute, 
So New Deal is sort of like social democracy, but a little bit lighter, right? Um, and then neoliberalism is what we have now. It's a dominant economic paradigm now, which is uh, really, if I had like an animal farm uh, slogan for neoliberalism, it would be markets good, state bad. So it's all about <laughs> minimizing the state, making it as small as possible, um, and, and uh, you know, laissez-faire, um, free market. And I just want to note that a lot of that is just rhetoric, and the reality is just totally hypocritical, right? So a lot of people that push for neoliberalism at the same time are super happy to have all kinds of protectionism and subsidies when it suits them. So there's the neoliberal uh, uh, claims uh, and the reality is quite different. So just one last thing I'll, I'll say about this. Um, a, a lot of people, especially in the context of the elections, there's a lot of talk of really what amounts to New Deal capitalism or maybe social democracy, which is still capitalism, right? It's still dominated by capitalist corporations, even though there's a much stronger role of the state, much stronger redistribution, much stronger um, public sector and social welfare state, but it's still capitalist. So that's really important when we're trying to think about where we headed. Um, and we would argue that if you don't have this clarity, then all the good things that you fight for um, and organize for and build, the, the tendency is for it to be within, within the confines of capitalism. And we end up strengthening capitalism instead of trying to move beyond it. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Emily. Uh, I, I suspect people heard me chuckle when uh, uh, Emily made the, the quip, markets good, state bad, as an animal farm reference, which then uh, inspires me to, to remember the, the words of Margaret Thatcher, who said about neoliberalism, there is no alternative. Uh, it became so famous during the 90s in the global justice uh, movement and uprising that it became known as TINA. There is no alternative. To which we in the post-capitalist framework, the Solidarity Economy Network and the growing movements that say one no, many yeses, ta-ta. There are thousands of alternatives. And I really want to underscore that for the, uh, one of the principles of the US Solidarity Economy Network is pluralism. For us, this post-capitalist economy is not a fixed blueprint. We acknowledge that there are multiple paths to the same goal. Our goal is without doubt, unquestionable, we are not going to compromise a racially and socially just and sustainable world. There are many efforts to get there, and we consider folks colleagues, even those who are trying to reform capitalism, they are still our colleagues. We believe ultimately that the bigger goal should be restructuring society. The next principle of the solidarity economy is a commitment to true solidarity, grounded in the collected, collective practices of cooperation, mutualism, reciprocity, altruism, love, caring, kindness, and gifting. And we are very uh, eager to incorporate the concepts of love, compassion, caring, and gifts into economic and political conversation. The third uh, principle of the solidarity economy uh, is a commitment to equity across all dimensions. Uh, that's not equality, but equity, a recognition that the way history has operated has literally exploited and oppressed people based on uh, race, uh, gender, sexual orientation, et cetera, and that if we are going to be genuinely equitable, uh, we have to create systems and structures that acknowledge that, dismantle those. You simply can't start, quote, equally, because those of us who are white or cisgendered or male in this society have historically been privileged. The next concept is sustainability, which draws very heavily. And honestly, uh, I am pushing myself now to even call it regenerative, 
to get to, to really acknowledge that it's not just sustaining the current thing, but to literally uh, allow the earth to recreate itself and that we have roles as stewards to help facilitate that. We recognize that it draws heavily upon the indigenous perspective of living in harmony with nature and each other. Uh, and uh, with a hat tip to my dear friend and colleague, Chris Peters of the Seventh Generation Fund for Indigenous Development, who reminds me uh, and, and crowds frequently that every human being on planet Earth descends from indigenous people. This is our birthright, folks. All of us descend from people who were once living in harmony, in watersheds, uh, uh, let's call them basins of relations, not just with human beings, but all life actually comes from uh, watersheds. That's actual reality. The last principle is a commitment to participatory democracy. We embrace the idea that if a decision affects your life, you ought to have an opportunity to help participate in making that decision. This, uh, we, this doesn't mean you get your way. It means we have to break down the us and them and understand the big we, that we're in it together, and we need a process to make and implement decisions in a genuinely democratic uh, fashion. Emily, did you want to say anything about the principles, since you're the one who taught me these principles? All right, so uh, hearing none, I will now move us to the next uh, concept. And the way we're going to do this now, now folks, is uh, these, that is solidarity economy. And as you saw, we did a deep dive, but you don't get a chance to do that whenever you're doing a candidate questionnaire, right? Because we're talking about how do we actually concretely introduce this concept of a solidarity economy into political discourse and move shift Overton's window. So what we're going to do now is look at some very concrete policies that are rooted into political discourse that we hear all the time, jobs being one of them. So uh, I'm wondering, Don and Emily, should we stop for a moment uh, and uh, have discussion around the big picture or does it make better sense to just dive right in uh, to what we have just uh, to what we have on the candidate questionnaire. Yeah, if there's any questions about solidarity economy in general uh, that people would like to ask now, feel free to type those into the Q and A. Um, we could have a few questions on that before we go on to the rest of the presentation. So thank you, Don. Uh, and I've just stopped sharing so that we can see uh, both Don and Emily and myself. And I want to acknowledge that uh, Juji, who also serves on the Solidarity Economy Network Board of Directors, was one of the uh, authors uh, uh, of this candidate questionnaire, writes in to say that she got a question from Markey's campaign, which, like just to say, folks, that's US Senator Markey from Massachusetts, who's asking about how the survey will be used. So I'll take this moment to really frame it. Great uh, job, first of all, Juji, that you're getting a response from a US Senator to, to our new tool. That's incredibly inspiring to me. And what we're going to do in the Solidarity Economy Network is to build out a website where any candidate who has uh, responded to the question will get the opportunity to have that uh, seen on the website. We'll also be sending out email alerts and so forth. We're building out a campaign for solidarity economy that does not promote an individual candidate, does not promote an individual party. The one thing we have to do, Juji, is to ensure that whoever Markey's uh, opponents are gets at least the opportunity uh, to answer the, the, the survey as well, right? Like what we can't be done is seeing that we're promoting Markey over any of their opponents. So uh, just to put a flag in that, uh, and I hope that answers the question. And Emily, I'm wondering, again, as the co-coordinator of USN, is this all making sense? Do you want to add anything uh, to that question or my answer? Yeah, I guess uh, it's a kind of a Clarification to Juji, um, was it as broad as that? Just how will the the 
survey be used? Were there other were there other issues that were raised? I'm just curious. And um, Juji can 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 she, she speak she, or she can't speak? She could only type. Yeah, she just typed into the Q&A module. Yes, I sent to Joe Kennedy's campaign as well. He's showing up across Massachusetts. Wonderful. And so thank you for that. Uh, and uh, we also need to ensure that the uh, Republican Party, if there are candidates there, get the opportunity to answer the question uh, and the Green Rainbow Party. Uh, because we can't also now, just as we can't be promoting an individual candidate, uh, we can't be promoting, promoting a political party either. So uh, great that you sent it to Joe Ken Kennedy's campaign. Uh, let's make sure if there are uh, primaries in, I, I think that the only three are uh, um, uh, Green Rainbow, uh, Republican and Democrat uh, in Massachusetts. So great that you did to Joe Kennedy. Let's ensure that any other candidates get it as well. Great. So I will go. Uh, any other comments or questions? Uh, feel free to type it either into the chat or into the Q&A box. All right. With that, then I will go back. Uh, uh, to uh, the screen and turn it over to Emily to talk about jobs. Yeah, so we, we constructed this uh, survey. Um, originally, we were really thinking about the, the national presidential elections, but I, I think it actually, um, and we did send it out, uh, got very little response. But I think it is a really useful tool on a more local level as well, maybe even more local than like on the national scene. So we wanted to look at, um, you know, a small number of hot button issues, you know, critical issues, um, critical problems, and what, what a solidarity economy response might be. It's not, it's clearly not exhaustive. Um, it's pretty broad, like would you in general support these kind of, um, of initiatives, uh, or would you in general support funding or, uh, so it was that level of broad support. Um, we are not, we didn't list specific policies. Um, just wanted to get a read on, would you support this or that in general? Um, so just running through those, uh, of course, the first was was jobs, right, clearly. There are, there's a huge lack of jobs and a lot of people are working more than one job, job just to make ends meet. So our response are um, one of the solutions are worker owned cooperatives. Um, we provide some um, reasons why we think that co-ops are part of the solution. So you can take a look at those bullet points. Um, we try to provide some actual um, data um, and then I think the question and Emily for the purposes of the slides we did not we took out the 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 question when we okay. presented last right so yeah. you might just want to okay. say it out loud yeah I don't remember what the question exactly it's but basically something like would you as broad as would you support policies that would support worker co-ops something to that effect um yeah so that you know we're when we do in the survey have uh resources uh backing up these claims like studies showing that on average worker-owned cooperatives outperform traditional businesses in terms of wages and benefits productivity job stability satisfaction um locally rooted boost civic engagement and just something about the national scene, right? That it's, they're re really experiencing an upward trend. And in a lot of cities are being used as a way to promote inclusive economic development. Okay, we can go. Um, right, so housing clearly, um, there's a, a lack of affordable housing. Half a million people experience homelessness in a single, you know, given night um right so we're we're 
identifying part of the problem is that housing is being treated as a commodity and something that you speculate on. So you buy your housing, you speculate that the property is going to become more valuable and then you sell it, sell it off for as much as you can make. Um, not only is this destabilizing to the economy on a national and even international level, um, as we saw in 2008, where we had a global meltdown that really stemmed from uh, real estate gambling, um, but it, it leads to a lot of housing being locked up in this speculative game um, and housing prices being um, bid up and up and up and up, uh, and so there's not enough affordable housing. So our, our solution, or one piece of the solution, is housing through a community land trust, where um, the it creates permanently affordable housing. You decommodify both the land and the housing um, by building in uh, limited equity. So basically, if you own, for example, a house on a community land trust, you get a really good deal on it. You'll probably get it for way below market rate. But then in return, you have to agree to sell it um, at a certain uh, markup that's dictated by a formula. So you do get to recapture some of the equity, the built, uh, built up equity, some. Um, you get to recoup anything that you've uh, invested. But if the prices of houses have, have doubled, you don't get to do that. You don't get to uh, just walk away with a huge uh, profit. Um, yeah, and it's, it's uh, controlled by uh, a community, um, community controlled board. So it has that long term um, mission um, and uh, definition of what this land and what this housing is used for. Okay, we can move on. Um, so climate change, I don't I don't think we have to go into too much detail about the problem of climate change. And what we're spotlighting are ener energy democracy. So community owned and managed forms of energy generation. So community owned solar or community owned wind. Um, yeah, and trying to figure out what sort of, um, what kind of supports need to be in place for these, these kind of community owned um, democratic structures to thrive. And uh, Emily, I'll just say a quick word for folks who really want to deep dive in what this might look like. Uh, 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 our colleagues in Transition US and Colorado I uh, literally did a webinar on work that they're doing towards that end. Uh, I want to acknowledge and lift up Janice, who is on this call. Uh, so there's there, the, ag underscoring again that there are many ways to actually uh, transition, but they will require engaging in politics and policy. Oh, this is me. So the next problem is what we're calling basically finance, and that is that privately owned banks uh, really are controlling the, the money supply uh, and they exist to maximize shareholder profit. It's the reason that uh, global uh, climate causing projects like pipelines and uh, oil and you know just the list goes on, even though scientifically by every study that's been looked at, these are literally exacerbating uh, climate change but they still happen and get financed because literally they're profitable. Again, the dictates of capital. So the, uh, they're accelerating the climate crisis. They're exacerbating income inequality because they're creating short-term profits for the shareholders. And as if that's not bad enough, literally the decisions on how community projects get done are being made by Wall Street bankers who have never even been in the community. So our solution at the Solidarity Economy Network, public banking. Not to be a coy, but a public bank is different than a private bank because it's owned and operated in the public interest. Uh, it literally allows us to democratize and pu make public financial decision making. 
Obviously, public banks can also be used to finance climate change solutions. They can be used to prioritize affordable housing, local businesses, uh, student loans. Uh, the, the list is really endless about what we could do with a public bank. And, and here's the kicker, especially to conservatives, public banking reduces taxes because the profits that are generated get returned to the general fund of the public bank. The, the bank has no need to charge interest or fees to itself. It literally eliminates or profoundly uh, reduces the interest rate of public infrastructure projects as much as 40%. Some studies show 50%. So public banking is a huge thing. I wanna take a quick moment to lift up uh, the work of the California Public Banking Alliance that just before COVID hit had created and passed a really groundbreaking legislation called AB 857, Assembly Bill 857, that allowed for the creation of local and regional public banks uh, uh, it was uh, passed through both the Assembly and the State Senate. Governor Newsom signed it. It was law. We were working with the Department of Business Organizations to promulgate the rules for how they would happen. All systems go. COVID hit. It's become very clear to us that we're not going to be able to capitalize local banks uh, during this pandemic and the economic crisis that is just beginning. So we have, we have shifted to another bill that has been introduced in California. AB 310. This will create the State Bank of California, a public bank. So all the benefits uh, would still be inured, but it would actually be a California-wide state bank. And I hope that we might get a little uh, more detail whenever we get in uh, to the larger discussion. Emily, I think you're up for participatory budgeting. Um, yeah, so we, we looked at this problem where um, public budgets are often, uh, where allocations don't always go to the communities that need it the most. Um, there are especially poor communities and communities of color that are ignored. And so um, people feel like, you know, on a local level, that they're, they're not represented, that democracy isn't working, and it, uh, it, it fuels this feeling of disconnect from our, our democratic system and feeling shut out. So um, we wanted to spotlight participatory budgeting, which started in Brazil in Porto Alegre, but since, well, I, I'm not sure what year, but it's, it's been a while. My guess is probably 20 years. It's spread all over the world, um, including the United States. Um, I know Chicago, Boston, New York, I, I can't remember all the cities. There's a number of cities where not the whole budget, but a, a slice of the budget, a, a slice of the discretionary municipal budget, um, or in some cases, it is the part of the budget of a particular um, city official, like a city councilor, hands that money over to uh, the people um, to make a decision. And there's a whole... Uh, infrastructure, a whole support infrastructure that's set up to help people understand how um, how the budget process works. And um, there's a whole cons consultative process. People submit their proposals about what to do with this money. Um, and then there's a democratic process of, of choosing the winners. Um, and it's been shown to be very, very, um, healthy for making people feel like they actually have some power and control, that they're represented, um, and that on a local level, you know, that, that they are part of our democratic system.
Am I saying something about this? You are. Uh, yeah. So like I mentioned, there's just re re references at the end. Um, if any, you know, if the if you give this to a candidate and they want more more information, we tried to keep it to a minimum, like not an endless list of references, uh, but just a place to start at least. Um, so, you know, we're totally uh, open to questions, thoughts, but also suggestions um, about how to make this better. So I'll stop there. And with that, uh, I will stop my screen share and uh, I will hopefully open it up for questions. And, and uh, in retrospect, uh, I regret that we didn't stop at each topic and have a little dialogue and back and forth. So I'm going to engage in a little constructive self-critique now. Uh, so if you do have a, uh, a question about either the, the format itself, how to use a, a candidate questionnaire, uh, or any of the specific policies, please let's just open it up for the conversation. And I'm wondering, do we have uh, any, oh, uh, I'm yeah. now, because I was sharing the screen, I wasn't able to access everything. So uh, I'll just say, Emily, I don't know if you're seeing it, uh, but Sari has written in to ask, how are community land trust finance? Is it public partnerships, local government, something else? So this is not exactly, I mean, I know something, but it's, I'm not an expert. There might be people on the call who are really deep into CLTs, but as far as I know, it, it varies a lot. Um, the CLTs will go for grants, they'll work with the city to acquire property, um, they'll take up collections from individuals, sometimes people who have a piece of, of land donate that land. Um, so lot, lots of different things, but the fact that you create a CLT that's a nonprofit, uh oh, um, makes makes it possible to leverage a whole range of of uh, financing. Can you hear me? Yes. I lost everybody else. Okay. All right, just want to make sure it's still working. Yeah, so um, yeah, just, just uh, there's a whole range of, of possibilities. It all depends on, on the local organizing and also what it's for. So in, in my neck of the woods, there's an organization called Equity Trust, and they're really leveraging the community land trust model for, for small farms. Um, so that's a different, a different kind of pool of money. Um, to go to. So it's it's quite flexible. And I'm wondering, Don, can you open Mike Strode's uh, uh, mic? Because he's got some words to share that rather than me simply reading him, I might invite him to, uh, to share a response. Mike serves with Emily and I on the board of directors of the Solidarity Economy Network. I think you got the mic, Mike. Oh, great. <laughs> um, so certainly, yeah. The, um, so what I what I posted there was just you know a link to Grounded Solutions Network's um, CLT uh, or startup. So it's just a page about sort of starting up uh, community land trust. But the other sort of examples that I would highlight, I highlighted Asheville Buncombe Community Land Trust in Asheville, North Carolina, which um, received a million dollars in a budget allocation from the city of Asheville. Um, you know, which so that's sort of a a municipal uh, or city partnership. But there's also more recently the House of Tulip in New Orleans, which um, through a GoFundMe has raised in three weeks about three hundred thousand um, dollars. You know, towards their development of a community land trust, which you know their unique model is that they are trying to develop housing for um, gender nonconforming transgender um, communities. Um, there in New Orleans. So, you know, it's solving that housing crisis issue for a very specific population. So there's that intersection between the solidarity economy and social movement work that um, I think is being spoken about here on the line. And Mike, I, I'm so glad you brought up Asheville because uh, to really lift it up, at least as it's being framed rolling out from Asheville, North Carolina, they're talking about it as a way to provide reparations to target the uh, African American community specifically to acknowledge uh, that uh, that historic legacy. Uh, so I think that again, it's a it, it, these are tools, and like any tool, 
can use, be used either more or less effectively. So I'm so glad that you brought up Asheville. Of course, of course, yeah, that is very true. Um, and yeah, the, it's definitely, a, the reparations discussion is still in, in development, but I did see that Asheville Boncombe Community Land Trust did post about it on their page. So they are part of those conversations and, and land and housing are part of those conversations as far as ways to restore and repair um, com those communities. Um, and so Janice Lynn has written in to ask, after you send out the survey and candidates respond, do you re publish the results to the community and voters? And the short answer is that's the way it should work, uh, Janice. Like remember that the US Solidarity Economy Network is literally the, a US network. And so for us, yes, we were trying to uh, get involved uh, early into uh, the, the, the presidential primaries, responses. We were moving fast, right? Uh, uh, but as Emily uh, alluded, uh, it is our belief that local elections are where this uh, will be the most helpful. And it's the reason that we are encouraging transition initiatives to work with the Solidarity Economy Network, the Transition U.S. Uh, Politics and Policy Working Group to customize this to your community to your specific needs and to put candidates on record. Will you support local democratically controlled energy production and transmission as a way to ameliorate climate change? Will you support a local public banking initiative in order to be able to finance climate change solutions and housing, uh, et cetera? Like all of these can be used at the very uh, local level. Uh, can you access the Q&A, uh, Emily? Because Juji asked a question and I'm wondering if, so I'm not the one always doing it, if you would uh, frame it um, and answer it. I can, I was just uh, trying to get the link over for the survey, people asked for that. I've already sent it, uh, I think under, uh, I typed an answer and I can share, Emily, what I'll do is, cause that's the public one so they can't edit it. But because, for example, my Transition U.S. Collaborative Design Council folks are well-trusted folks, I will get them a version that they can use for themselves and, and edit and customize. Okay, great. So I will not bother doing that. Um, so is it, it's a Q&A one? Okay. Yes. I wonder if the letter can be revised to be more specific about uses. Also a bit on jobs that frames co-ops needs to be updated post-pandemic. Yeah. Um, so I would really, really, really encourage people to take this and run with it, right? This is kind of a template. And if it looks useful to you to use on a local level, and you, if there is some local policy that you want to actually ask the candidates very specifically about, would you support this? do it i mean i don't feel like um from a sen perspective we we don't feel proprietary about this we hope that it's useful people will take it and and tailor it however it makes sense um juji you're i'm sure you're right we should think about um about reframing a bit in the in the post covid or the covid situation um we probably should go through the whole document with an eye towards that. And so, thank you. Yes, I agree. I, I literally, Emily, uh, I had typed that into the Q and A part. So, great minds thinking alike. Uh, Juji, thank you so much. Uh, very obviously needs to be done. I'll just note. Uh, so, Aya uh, writes in this. Uh, oh, thank you. What a great overview of our societal problems. I love this presentation. Thank you. And I, I'll just say. Thank you for writing that in. I think that those of us on the left or the progressive social change world, we don't do enough thank you, way to go. You know, we don't celebrate each other or ourselves often enough. And I really want to say that that really felt good to me to read that sentence uh, from you. And I love working with you because you bring that energy everywhere. Uh, Marissa writes in to say, here's a link to the recording for local energy webinar that David referenced. Again, lifting up Janice and the amazing work uh, that they're doing in Colorado. 
Uh, Mike writes in, uh, who you heard earlier about Committee Land Trust. He wrote in to say, a small slice for Chicago. We are applying pressure on that one through a look towards adding the questionnaire to that strategy. I suspect, Mike, that that was participatory budgeting because I know that y'all are like at cutting edge in Chicago uh, on using that one. Let's see. Uh, Emily, again, at any point, if you want to just jump in, I'm just trying to make sure that we honor the folks who yeah. cut in. Yeah, I'll also jump in on this comment um, that says Burlington, Vermont created a community land trust many years ago. Uh, I think they were one of the first. Now, I don't know if they predated um, the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. I, I don't know which one was first, but I sort of suspect that Dudley Street was was first. So that's Boston. And if you don't know that example, it's a really, it's a, it's an amazing example, right? So they actually got uh, the power of eminent domain to um, gain ownership of several blocks that were really blighted. There was a lot of arson for hire. Um, and if you go to the Dudley Street neighborhood um, initiative, this CLT, it's it just feels immediately different right those blocks feel just different they feel different they look different um it's a it's a really beautiful place and it's still the the people that were, were lived there before pretty low income um community of color uh they have not been displaced uh, they've been able to find housing at like for boston remarkably affordable prices and they always have a seat at the table because they own this uh, a seat at the economic development table because they own that land. Um, but talking about Burlington, for me personally, it was one of my frustrations that here we have Ber Bernie Sanders, who was mayor of Burlington, Vermont, and he never, ever, I never, ever, 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 ever heard him say anything uh, that we from Solidarity Economy would point to in terms of practices. So nothing about community land trusts, nothing about worker cooperatives, nothing, nothing like that, right? Um, and so that was part of why we we wanted to do this, right? To give a little nudge, even if it's just a little mention by some of the candidates uh to to start getting it in the the mix uh, that there are alternatives that aren't about maximizing profit that are democratic that are uh, about equity um just starting to get it in into the public conversation seemed like a useful thing uh, I'll, I'll take this moment to smile uh, about the good-natured uh boston or burlington being first uh the reality is uh y'all that like uh there was, and notice that one was 84, one was 89. And I really want to underscore that this is what happens when social movements are actually speaking a narrative. Uh, you know, policies and proposals become uh, more, uh, well, that's what Overton Window mean, right? It, like, like, because this was advancing at a time in a bioregion, uh, it became likely. And I do think that it's worth pointing out, uh, you know, that Bernie, for all of the wonderful uh, rhetoric he had around uh, inequality and the need uh, for new systems, did not talk about the level of concrete policies uh, that, that have broad support. And, you know, study after study shows that if you actually do a little educating, and I don't mean a push pull, but if you actually let people understand, so here's objectively what a worker-owned co-op is. Here's objectively what a community land trust is. Here's objectively what a public bank is. Every one of these policies have broad and deep support across political uh, ideology and party affiliation, right? And it reminds me of uh, the great labor organizer, Samuel Gompers, who in organized labor said, we will support our friends and we will punish our enemies in, during elections. And he said, we will have no permanent friends and no permanent enemies. I think that what we have to do is recognize the need to build from the bottom up a participatory process that's making genuine demands on the political system and that we are not going to accept what the leadership tells us is acceptable or allowable, 
that we are going to be genuinely politically independent. That's the lesson of the global South. Part of the reason that I would argue that Latin America, especially, but all across the global South, uh, the left and progressives are so much further ahead of us is they have real clarity on what capitalism is, what imperialism is, and about how to engage electoral politics without becoming electoral fetishists. They put the movement first uh, and then they make demands uh, and don't play the game that the neoliberals try to make us play. So I think that we've gone through all of the chat. I think that we've gone through all of the q and I will open it up one more time uh, to, to any, in, any participant uh, for a question or comment, either in the chat or the Q&A. Uh, if not, uh, I'll then uh, ask Emily for any closing words uh, for the Solidarity Economy Network, and then we'll turn it over to Don to close us out. Oh, thank you, Kat. Kat writes in super inspiring on so many levels. Thank you so much. Kat, it's a, a real pleasure to work with you on the Collaborative Design Council. So those words make me feel good. Emily, uh, and thank you. Now, Marcus writes in from the Solidarity Economy Network. So we're getting love from both of the two national organizations. So this cross-pollination really makes me happy, really happy. Emily, how about some final words for the Solidarity Economy Network? Yeah, well, I don't know if it's final words, but it did make me think about why is it that nobody talks about these kind of concrete, quote unquote, alternative economic practices, although, you know, some of them are not all that alternative and some of them, I mean, some of them are old practices, cooperatives are super old. Um, uh, some of them are main street mainstream um some public sector program public schools for example are mainstream but solidarity economy would certainly embrace public education um but why is it so why is it perceived uh, as being a scary thing to talk about um my experience like my day job uh, as a co-director of wellspring cooperative in building worker-owned businesses worker-owned cooperatives is that it, it, it actually is not scary to people. Um, you know, we built on an anchor institution model. So we, we did go and we talked to the major hospitals and co big colleges, universities. Uh, so these are mainstream institutions and we, we did not find any hostility whatsoever, especially in Springfield, Massachusetts. So it's the third largest city in Massachusetts. It's in pretty bad shape. It's a hurting city. And so any, any ideas about how to create jobs um, in a, any new approach was, was really welcome. But I think a lot of the things that we're talking about could be framed as, you know, sort of, American is apple pie, right? This is about people coming together, working together. Um, you know, it is democratic. Uh, so it doesn't have to be a scary thing. Yes, it's possible. It can get tagged as, um, you know, pinko, commie, socialist, whatever. But I, I don't know. I think we have to get past that. And these days, it goes down pretty well. So I'm still mystified why... Um, why it isn't more in the sort of political electoral discourse, um, but I think it's a shame. Um, and other than that, thanks to everybody for, for joining us. It's, uh, it's fun to, to talk about these issues and, and share. Great, well, thank you so much, Emily and David. Uh, I think it's at least partially our job to get this into the mainstream political discourse, um, these, these amazing solutions that uh, we have already have available to us and are already working in many places.